This is 5-Minute Friday on a framework for big life decisions. Professor Myra Strober, it's great to have you on the Super Data Science Podcast. I'm delighted to have an expert like you here on the show. You're Professor Emerita at Stanford University, where you have been on the faculty for over 50 years. You founded the Stanford Center for Research on Women. You've published countless peer-reviewed articles at the intersection of economics and gender studies, and you published four books. Your fifth book, Money and Love, An Intelligent Roadmap for Life's Biggest Decisions, will be out on January 10th in the U.S., and then also available a little bit later around the world. So let's talk about your book. There's a popular perception that love and money don't mix, that romantic decisions should be made using your intuition, your heart, while financial decisions or career decisions should be made using reason and intellect. Your research, however, suggests that isolating love from money during big decisions leads to regrets. Can you fill us in on that? Yes, um, this idea that money and love are separate, that you should uh, figure out who you're going to marry with your heart and figure out where you're going to work with your head or your pocketbook um, really doesn't work very well. Because, in fact, in our lives, money and love decisions are inextricably in an intertwined. Mm. Um, and, for instance... Uh, suppose you decide that there's a wonderful job somewhere across the country that you need to take. Um, and, you know, unless you're single with no ties uh, of any sort, no romantic ties of any sort, um, you need to check in with other people about that decision uh, because it's going to affect them. And uh, it's going to affect you, and it may first affect your heart, mm -hmm. uh, but pretty soon it's going to affect your career as well, mm -hmm. because you can't go to work every day if things at home are really in bad shape uh, and do your job the way you'd like to. So you need to take into account uh, what's going on in the rest of your life when you make money decisions. Similarly, you know, people think that getting married to someone is a love decision and you fall in love, the other person reciprocates and off you go into the horizon. Mm -hmm. um, no, because love uh, is part of marriage, but so is money. Right. You are going to be interested in how you and this person you love are going to make it in the world. Right. Uh, how are you going to finance your marriage? And if you have children, your children, and, you know, how you're going to make decisions about where you're going to live and what you're going to invest in and how you're going to retire and on and on and on. So these decisions are forever. Right. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. But we don't talk about it enough. That is something it, it almost seems like taboo in a lot of romantic partnerships to have money come up. Well, that's right. I mean, it's considered um, unseemly materialistic. Uh, to right. talk about money um, early on in your relationship, but um, you need to do that. You need to talk about a lot of things uh, before you make a decision uh, to marry someone or not get married and live with them. And uh, and by the way, people think that as long as they're not getting married, they don't have to have these conversations, mm. which is not true either. <laughs> Because if you live with somebody and you're sharing the rent uh, or not sharing the rent, um, that's a decision. And, um, you know, again, it's going to affect everything in your life, how you um, deal money-wise mm -hmm. with the person that you're living with. Right. So, well, thankfully, your new book, Money and Love, provides a framework for making big life decisions where financial and romantic incentives might tug in opposite directions. So I think this kind of thing, intuitively to me, this kind of situation comes up all the time where you might have this great new career opportunity, but it involves more travel, more time being away from your loved ones. And so these kinds of, um, you know, we only have a, a certain amount of time in the week and often new professional opportunities mean less time for our personal relationships and vice versa. 
some great personal uh, opportunity, going on a trip, uh, maybe taking some time off to go on safari or something could have a negative impact on some deals that you had working on in the office and it could adversely affect your career. So uh, personal life, professional life, uh, romantic decisions, financial decisions, they can often be tugging in opposite directions. And, and so life's most difficult big decisions are characterized by this kind of tug. Um, but you have devised a framework specifically to cut through life's complexities. And you do that with five simple C words. So uh, according to your book, uh, the first one is clarify what's important. The second is to communicate. Third is to consider the broad range of choices available to you. The fourth is to check in with friends, family, and potentially other resources. And then uh, the fifth one is consequences, that is exploring consequences. So um, readers can check out your book to dig into uh, those five and get specific examples, all the detail on them. Which of these is your favorite or do you think is the most important, Professor Strober? <laughs> You know, they're all important, and certainly you need to clarify before you communicate with your spouse or your boss or your coworker. You need to clarify what you want. But communication is key, uh, really, really key. Um, I, I had one acquaintance who decided on her way home from work one day, she had a very responsible job, and, oh, excuse me, on her way to work that day, that she really didn't want to be leaving her kids in the morning uh, with a caretaker and you know child care worker, and she wanted to quit her job and uh, stay home with her young kids. So she went to work and she told her boss that very day that she was quitting, and <laughs> she cleared out her desk and came home and gave her husband the news, mm -hmm. and he was horrified, <laughs> mind you he had the capacity more than the capacity to support that family all by himself. So that was not the issue. Mm -hmm. The issue was he told her that despite the fact that she earned less than he did, he always regarded her earnings as some kind of a bulwark in mm -hmm. case he lost his job mm -hmm. or he needed to quit his job for some reason, the family would have an ongoing income, which was also pretty good. Um, if she were in the workforce and she didn't know this about him or about them. And uh, mm. she was very regretful eventually mm. uh, that she had done this without saying a word to him about it. So that's an example of you know, poor communication. I've been watching the newest series of the crown, the Netflix right. production. Yeah. Brilliant program. It's painful to watch how, Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip um, try to communicate and don't succeed very well. Mm. Um, and, you know, there, of course, her job is is primary uh, to their relationship, mm -hmm. um, but but they've never learned to communicate. And so, you know, just before they're about to go to bed, one of the two of them drops a bombshell <laughs> and they don't have time. They're tired. Um, and so it goes unresolved. And, uh, you know, of course, this is fictional. We don't know what actually happened. But right. it's hard to pick that up in the morning because you've spent the whole night wondering about it. And people need to learn that when you've got something really important to communicate to your partner, you need to make an appointment. Right. Just like make an appointment to tell your boss some uh, major development. Right. Find a quiet place and listen. Listen. Um, you know, in our in our jobs, particularly in our high tech jobs, we 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 don't spend enough time listening to one another. Right. I had one student who um, had had considerable experience in the workplace before he came back to get his um, MBA and. We were having a discussion in class about uh, maternity leaves, and he was proud to report uh, to the class, uh, 50 people in the class, he was proud to report that he was a very good boss, and that when uh, somebody told him they were pregnant, 
he would tell them that they should take maternity leave and they should stay out as long as possible. They should take the longest maternity leave that they could and so on. And finally, after he was extolling this um, behavior of his, <laughs> one of the women in the class said, wait a minute. She said, I, I don't want to take a long maternity leave. I don't like dealing with um, infants. I want to get back to work just as soon as I can. And he was so surprised by this. Uh, he was a good guy, wanted to do the right thing. And what he learned from that interaction is that he needs to communicate with each person that he's supervising, that he's managing, right. find out what it is they want. He needs to listen before he tells them, you know, how great it would be if they took a long maternity leave. Right. So At these work. So these items, the five simple C words for cutting through life's complexities and making these big decisions. These, so again, those are uh, clarify, communicate, consider, check in, and explore consequences. Those apply, uh, those aren't, so initially a couple of those examples that you gave, it sounded like we were having these clarifications, these communications, largely being on the personal side of your life, but equally it's important to be applying them on the professional side with the example that you just gave. So that communicate, it isn't just about getting things right with your partner or your loved ones. It's about getting things right with your employees or your employer as well. Right, right. Cool. Um, well, uh, this is enormously helpful. Um, I think that this is gonna be an invaluable resource for our listeners. Uh, yeah, having this kind, of, this kind of book, Money and Love, An Intelligent Roadmap for Life's Biggest Decisions to be able to guide us through, um, yeah, how to make these tough decisions where we have uh, financial and romantic incentives tugging in opposite directions. Uh, seems like an invaluable resource. Um, uh, do you we have, don't, we don't want people to be regretful if possible, right? We want them to make a decision and have some confidence in the decision. And then later on say to themselves, you know, I, I made the best decision I could make. Maybe it was the wrong decision, but I, I couldn't, I couldn't have done better because I really worked at this. So that's my goal is to have people make the best decisions that they can make. Yeah, it seems like uh yeah, a great effort to have done that. Was there were there any particular um reasons why you had the um the inspiration to create this book after all the other publications that you had, all the after all the other books that you've had? What was it about this particular problem that you were like, this is something that based on my research or based on you know, the wisdom that I've, I've accumulated, uh, this is, you know, I can make a huge impact with this particular book. I taught this course at first uh, when I started um, at Berkeley, and it right. was called um, Women in Work. And then it morphed to become Work and Family. And then I had some intrepid guys take the class saying, who would change the name of the class from work and family to, uh, from uh, women in work to work and family, uh, we'll get we'll get guys to take this class. Mm -hmm. So men started taking the class and the class was just so much better. <laughs> the discussions were so much better. So then I retired, but I kept teaching this course. Um, mm -hmm. And then I decided I didn't want to teach anymore. And I decided that I would write a book about it. And Abby Davison, one of my former students who has real life experience with all of this and has young children mm -hmm. said she wanted a career change. And so I asked her to write the book with me and Perfect. we just had a wonderful time writing this book together. And we came up with the five C's together as we oh. write. Nice. So it was a great experience. Awesome. Well, yeah. So I, and I should have mentioned Abby as well. Uh, co your co-author of the book. Uh, I'm glad that you brought her up. Uh, I should have right from the very beginning. It isn't, yeah, solely your work. Uh, great that you were able to uh, connect with a student like that and uh, have her involved in the development of the book. So I think that my second husband, Jay Jackman, who unfortunately passed away while I was writing this book. I read that while I was doing the research. I'm so sorry to hear that. Thank you. He, he, he was so important to my understanding of all this, particularly about communicating. And he told me about 
the definition of intimacy being into me see. And if you want to have good communication with a loved one, you need to be willing to let them see into you. And the only way they can do that is by your telling them what's going on. Uh, so I thought that was such a phenomenal insight that I want to be sure to put that out in this book. Nice. Well, thank you for sharing that with our audience as well, Professor Strober. It's been fabulous having you on the show. No doubt your five C's, clarify, communicate, consider, check in, and explore consequences. Uh, that framework will be super helpful to many of our listeners as they confront more big, of the big life decisions that uh, are ahead in their lives and hopefully fewer regrets lie ahead in their lives as well. Thanks to you. Thank you so much. All right, that's it for this 5-Minute Friday episode. Until next time, keep on rocking it out there, folks, and I'm looking forward to enjoying another round of the Super Data Science Podcast with you very soon.